So all your questions with bacterial testing. Here we go. So first I wanted to talk about um, what is healthy. And I feel like, you know, we, we, we always, you know, talk about where do we start? What do we do? But we really have to determine what is healthy. If they're not healthy, they're sick. We have to remember that hygiene does not fix sick. Hygiene is for maintenance, not therapy. So do you look at someone's skin and determine how healthy they are? You don't, you have no idea. So when you go in for a physical, what do they do? They do blood tests, they do um, testing, they do all these things to figure out really how healthy you are. Uh, and also the most common infection in the world is periodontal disease. And I know, you know, we know most of y'all here today, but, um, you know, we like to use the word infection uh, versus periodontal disease, because when you talk to a patient and you say the word infection, you know, they get it. They know they have heard the word infection, but periodontal disease eh, you know, their grandmother, this, that and the other had periodontal disease. Um, and also periodontal disease is both an infection and a disease. So those words are kind of interchangeably there. Uh, and periodontal disease traditionally is the only disease infection slash infection that gets treated the same way, no matter how bad it is. Um, and that's crazy. Really, when you think about it, that's crazy. No other, uh, nothing else in medicine gets treated the same way, no matter how bad it is. Only in periodontal disease. So I first wanted to talk about if there's any new folks, uh, really just maybe just a quick little summary about our test, uh, really what we do, bacterial sampling. So here is our kit. And since I'm on camera, I'll just show you live. Here's what our kit looks like. It's, it's super fancy. Uh, not really, but I mean, it's so cute. And so we have a little kit. We've got our paper points, as you can see here. Um, and this here's what the paper points look at. Uh, we have five paper points that you place down into the deepest pockets, place them back into this tube, and then send everything back to us. So here's the little tube that you place everything back to us. The paper points are designed to absorb bacteria, absorb moisture. And so that's why we like the paper points is because they go down to the base of the pocket. They're able to collect those anaerobic pathogens, and that's where you're going to harbor the most pathogenic pathogens. So just a little summary, here we go. Uh, you take the paper points, place them into the tube, secure the lid, fill out the order form, send everything back to us. Once we have this little kit back, as uh, long as there's no snowstorms in Tennessee, <laughs> but for real, uh, you'll have your report back in about 72 hours. I know Sarah, you're laughing because you're in Fort Collins, but we'll have your result, result ready in about 72 hours. So we send you the kits for free. So the kits are free of charge to receive, and then they're 109 to send back to us. Um, so, you know, most, I would say the majority of our customers, I, but like I said, majority charge about 150. Um, and then we have them back to you in about 72 hours. Now, if you're able to bulk three or more into a UPS pouch, the price is $99. So we do give you a discount if you're able to bulk those pathogens or those uh, kits into a pouch. Okay, so just how to review a lab test with a patient. That was one of the questions, of course, that we do receive a lot a lot daily actually. And so I just wanted to kind of go over how to review. Uh, we just got some sample reports here. Um, so what we're looking at, we're looking at the 11 pathogens linked to periodontal disease. You know, we know there's about five to seven, 500 to 700 different types of bacteria in the mouth. And we are worried about the 11 that are linked to periodontal disease. So anytime there's bacteria above this antibiotic threshold line that you see across the chart, the lab will then give you an antibiotic suggestion according to the bacteria present. So for example, uh, we've got, I don't know if you all can see this down here, amoxicillin, whoops, sorry about that. Why did that happen, Tasha? I don't, I don't know. Okay, let's go back. <laughs> I think I just rolled my mouse there. Okay, so as you can see here, we've got amoxicillin and metronidazole because we've got a few pathogens above this antibiotic threshold line. Now, this antibiotic threshold line uh, is based on 300,000 Americans class three. So that being said, I wouldn't say it's a one size fits all line, but 
you know, that's on a healthy patient. So think about if you have a patient that's compromised, heart disease, diabetic patient, uh, you know, that's not a somewhat healthy patient. So you're going to have to be a little bit more aggressive uh, thinking when if you have a patient that is compromised. So that is what that line is based on. We have to have some sort of a guideline as of to how much is too much bacteria or is, is you know, the body can the fight off itself without an antibiotic. Um, and we do know a lot of these pathogens are um, anaerobic and scaling and root planing resistance. And so that's why, um, you know, we sometimes have to put the patient on a systemic antibiotic. And that's, of course, one of our questions here coming up. Uh, and then also talking about, you know, how, uh, how aggressive are these pathogens and how they're color coded. This is based on Sokransky's work uh, back in 1998 and how he, um, you know, how the pathogens live amongst each other. Okay, so why is it important to test for all 11 pathogens? Like I was saying, we've got 11 pathogens that we're testing for, and why is it so important to test for those 11? Um, we've got also six, so we've got five keystone pathogens, which is your AA, your red complex, and your fusobacterium, which is this orange complex right here. Those are traditionally called your keystone pathogens. Um, but when we have those intermediate pathogens, like I've listed out here, these six intermediate pathogens, those are the ones that you can actually, when you detect, you can start treatment before bone loss. So those are um, a little bit not as invasive and they, uh, you can treat them. So once you get into those real aggressive pathogens, that's when you get bone loss. Um, so these intermediate pathogens, testing for those, you can really do clinically, you can really do um, some good treatment there. Any questions before all that? I muted everyone just because there was a little bit of interference noise. So please unmute yourself if you have questions. I didn't want to get too far if there was, because I start just going. Good? Yeah. Everyone good? Good. Everyone good? Yeah. So that's why, I, I mean, um, you don't just want to test for anything that's, um, you know, scaling root planning resistance or tissue invasive. You really want to test for those intermediate pathogens. I think that's a good lead off too, Jen, Jen, because it's like treating gingivitis is really, I mean, the most optimal time to treat a patient because then you're literally completely <laughs> reversing this disease and in slash infection to where it's not going to progress into a more advanced infection. And, and I've been personally extremely surprised at how much bacteria some patients have that don't have any bone loss yet. I mean, like kids that have AA and red complex and they don't have any, any bone loss yet, but oftentimes it's because their parents have periodontal disease. And so those family of origins are huge. You know, we think of, you know, just, you know, kissing our kids and giving them hugs and, and right. breathing on each other and sharing drinks and sharing food. I mean, now with COVID, we're so much more aware of how much bacteria and, and stuff we're sharing with one another but it's really nice to have those lower levels because it's like, okay, this is going to be more of a slam dunk case because it's going to be that much easier to get rid of versus once you have those keystone pathogens that are just so much more tissue invasive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you're, then you're in big trouble, big time. So it is definitely beneficial to test, um, test for all the pathogens. Absolutely. Um, Okay, so the next question we get a lot is, um, isn't bacterial testing just for antibiotic recommendations? Um, and this question is, I mean, we get this daily, daily, we get this question and it's not. The question is uh, no. And uh, think about, um, like, let's say when you go to your physician's office and they do a blood panel, uh, you know, they want to do like, just, just get a baseline of what's going on. So it's not necessarily just for antibiotic res uh, recommendations, because a lot of times you just want to get a baseline. You just want to see where that patient is. Um, and me personally, I like to offer um, everything to every patient. And I know you do too, Tasha. Um, you want to say, hey, this is, this is what we have. This is what we can do for you. Because me personally, when I go into the physician's office or I go anywhere, tell me what you offer. Tell me what you think is beneficial for me. And then I will decide if I want to pay for that or if I might, you know, if I want to do that. And so um, 
a lot of times we do get bacterial, we do get results in that are just for a baseline, um, you know, and also if a patient maybe is, um, you know, trying to get pregnant, sometimes they just kind of want to see where they, where they are. Um, and then also, uh, you know, we have a lot of tests that come in uh, for, a pa for patients that are going in for hip and knee replacements. And so that's just a screening tool to find out, um, you know, if there is an infection. So uh, the answer to that is no. Um, anything you want to add there, Tasha? No, I think, no, I think that was great. I mean, like just the, just the fact of comparing it to, you know, when you go in for a blood panel and let's say that your cholesterol was a little bit high and you wanted to work on diet and exercise, and then you go back to the doctor a couple months later, you tell doctor, I've been working really hard. How do you know if it's lower? You take another test. You and take so another that, test. That comparison mm -hmm. is just so critical because for us now, it's like, did our therapy work? I mean, so many of our diagnostic parameters are a little bit subjective. You know, what if that yeah. patient sees a different clinician next time? Maybe what I think is healthy isn't the same thing as, you know, my, the other hygienist in my office, Jennifer, maybe she thinks that a couple bleeding points isn't a big deal, but I'm like, oh my gosh, but it's the worst thing. It's the worst. So, yeah. so really having like that, those objective views of, you know, photography, microscopes, lab mm -hmm. testing, it's so mm -hmm. much better now that we can be more like the physician's office versus just like, well, this is what it looks like to me. Right. I mean, you go into a physician's office now, the first thing they do is testing on everything. They want to know all the details. So you have a baseline. I mean, I've got my baseline over here in my file cabinet from way back when of everything. And so I dig that out and I'm 43 now, but I've got it when I was in my twenties and I dig it out and I'm, I'm pretty good though, believe it or not. <laughs> but I mean, you have, you don't even know where you've started if you don't know, um, or you don't know how good you're doing if you don't know where you started. So uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, not for just antibiotic re recommendations. Okay, now it's just, dead okay there we go <laughs> <laughs> mine does that too sometimes I'm like uh -huh. Come on, I'm do I okay so then the next question we get a lot is do I have to put the patient on the antibiotic uh the answer to that is no so you don't have to put the patient on the antibiotic um you know back to that initial I guess it was the third slide I have is uh you know traditionally Periodontal disease is the only disease infection that traditionally gets treated the same way, no matter how bad it is. So we always, I always think about that all the time is, um, you know, we, we've got to come back to customizing treatment plans for patients and doing that, we have to understand the concept of what is a periodontal infection. And so do I always have to put the patient on the antibiotic? Of course, no, uh, it depends on the patient. You know, that of course, of course depends on the patient. And we know as dental professionals and especially dental hygienists, we know, um, you know, we look at that, we have the health history, we know what's going on. We know what the treatment plan is. Um, so sometimes there are patients that a uh, healthy patient have been in for 10 years say, hey, we've got this bacterial test. We, we've done a culture. Yeah, you do have infection, but you're healthy. Um, you're, you're willing to do your home care, you're here. And so let's see what we can't do without placing you on the antibiotic. Let's do a follow-up test to see if the treatment was successful. You know, not that the hygienist is not doing a good job. I think we've got to, you know, forget about that because we are doing a good job. You know, we, we do good jobs. So that's just, we don't even talk about that. So it's, <laughs> you know, it's about how the patient is going to respond to the treatment. So that's why it's sometimes good to do a follow-up test. And if the follow-up test still looks pretty bad, yeah, then maybe that is the time to put the patient on an antibiotic. Um, Tasha or anybody else? Anyone? Unmute yourself. Chime in. I know Sarah. She's, she's all kinds of info. I know she does. Maybe at the end, they'll have more for I us. think so. <laughs> so anyways. You're okay, just doing such a good job, Jennifer. You're answering all the questions before anyone has I, them. I know it. Here we go. Okay. So that was leading into, so I'm going to go back to that question just because, okay, this is just kind of going into that antibiotic question. Do I have to put the patient on the antibiotic? We said no. Okay. But also remember, here is an ulcerated pocket. 
These are periodontal pathogens making their way into an ulcerated pocket. So we have to remember the amount of gum tissue on, in the mouth is what is on your forearm. That's a ton. So that is a wound on your forearm. So that's ulcerated, basically. So let's just say that you have this ulcerated wound on your forearm. You go into your physician and they clean it, they debride it, but they don't fit you on an antibiotic. So just think about that. So that is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with some pretty nasty critters there. Um, and this, this actually is taken from uh, Sunstar cell-to-cell -cell communication. I don't know if you've all ever seen this. Have I told you about this, Tasha? I may have not told you about this. I don't know. Okay, but this is my favorite. Um, it's like 16 minutes, but you don't need all that 16 minutes. Dr. Larkin, you'll watch the whole thing probably, but this, I'm talking like you just need that three, the first three minutes. It talks about like, it's amazing, but these pictures are amazing. Talking about how much ulcerated tissue, and then basically talks about how the pathogens just, just go into the crevices of the ulcerated tissue. So that being said, a lot of our pathogens are scaling and replanning resistance. So, uh, you know, you, that's why it's really important to customize that treatment and forget about treating all the patients the same. Really look at the report, look at the patient, look at the patient systemically and also restorative. You know, does this patient have a ton of MOD amalgams, failing implants, crowns, you know, all the things, then it's going to be really hard to get that bacterial load down. Um, so, you know, when we're finding P. gingivalis in the brain and in the arterial walls of the heart, um, you know, you know, scaling is just, yeah, I mean, it's just going to be hard to get rid of that, y'all. Yeah. Well, and, so, and with this ulcerated areas, like what we understand now is that um, once the gum tissue is swollen, it becomes leaky because it becomes porous. So mm -hmm. think of a tightly knit sweater. And that's how it's supposed to be. That's how those epithelial cells are supposed to be. But once there's inflammation, it's like any inflammation anywhere in your body, in your gut, for instance, and it just becomes porous and leaky. So these bad bugs no longer are staying in our mouth. It, they, they get all over in, into our body, which is also why they're being found in direct proportion in our innermost arteries, why in donated blood, they're being found in our, in the blood of, so glad you know, you of that. A blood transfusion of, you yeah. know, for giving that blood to a very sick patient, you know, they're going to have a lot higher risk of maybe having a problem with it. And that person that donated is thinking they're doing a good thing because they don't understand that, whoa, my mouth is in bad shape. So mm -hmm. we're just, we're just learning so much more that we just didn't know before. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because that was my oh, next little spiel. <laughs> but this, I love to find articles that are not in like RDH, dental hygiene, dental, you know, all the dental magazines. This was in Blood Transfusion Magazine last year, last year. So basically what this means is, you know how when you go donate blood, and these are just, this is just one, actually, this is probably my favorite little article. You know how when you go donate blood, they say, oh, if you had a tattoo, you know, this, that, and the other, no, 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 okay, okay. You have your sweater on, you don't think you think about it. But just think about if you had a short sleeve shirt on and you went in and this was all just a big old wound, pus, pus bleeding, infected, red. I mean, the gals, you know, that are there working, they're going to be like, uh... I don't know if that's a good idea, but if it's in your mouth, it's okay. So what they're finding is blood donators with blood donors with periodontitis are considerably likely to donate contaminated blood, contaminated blood. It's crazy. So basically if you go in, if you basically here, we're going to say, if, we're, if you, if you need blood, Tasha, I'm going to have to go give it to you. Cause you know, I don't have periodontal disease. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, I hope our I blood mean, matches. So, I mean, that's basically what's happening is they have found that the donated blood has periodontal pathogens, um, which I mean, make totally makes sense. So that just tells you um, how the blood just, you know, just throws throughout the body. Um, but this is one of my, I love this article just because it's, when I read that, I was like, wow, that's just crazy. But I guess it, it makes sense. I mean, I can, I, I believe it. A couple of questions, Jen. Yeah. Um, I missed this, this first one and it was, um, how do your labs compare to, to bristle? So uh, you, let me, let me see that chat. 
Uh, the B R I S T L E. That's that's an that's a pretty new one, I think. Yeah, uh, from, I can't remember. I looked that up. Um, I can't remember exactly, but I don't think they test the bacteria. I'll look it up when Tasha, when you're chatting, when your turn, I'll look it up because I cannot okay. remember exactly. I know we talked about this, but I don't think if they're testing for the actual pathogens. Um, so with our test, we're doing a DNA PCR. What that means is, so before right, 2020, no one ever heard of PCR, uh, but we've been doing this since 2005. So PCR basically stands for polymer chain reaction. But what that means is we're testing the DNA of the dead bacteria. That's all that means. And so uh, with that being said, we're able to get a very accurate result and we can tell you exactly what type of bacteria and to what levels. And so that's what's different between that, between our test and say culturing, uh, because you really can't do a culture because a lot of these, a lot of these pathogens are anaerobic. So unless you had a uh, a laboratory, you know, right here, uh, you wouldn't be able to do it as some sort of a culture. Uh, but when we talk about the test, we do use the word culture just because um, I was just talking to, to some folks today. I mean, patients understand this is what patients get. They get infection, culture, antibiotics. Um, there was one more that I was talking about that they get, but they get those words. Um, you know, they don't get probe. The probe is not good. That's a bad word probably to them. And it really is just a notch metal stick. But anyways, probe, um, you know, periodontal disease, they just don't get those words. So uh, you can use the word culture, even though it's, it's really not a live culture. But when talking to patients, you can use the word culture. But I'm thinking with that Bristol, um, I don't so think Sue, they test. So Sue chimed in here. Thanks, Sue. Yeah. She, she like was it. saying that bristle tests for everything in saliva, regardless of whether it's a periodontal pathogen or not. Let me check on Maybe that. Maybe she can expound upon that more if, yeah. if, I, if um, once, once we kind of get in, in between, once you're done with yours. Yeah, and then there's look another question from Pam about laser. So how does LBR compare to um, controlling or knocking back the pathogens as effective as, as like an antibiotic, systemic antibiotic therapy, I believe is the question. Yeah, so we have a lot of customers that use a laser. Um, and so they get a lot of success with that. Um, you know, and that's definitely, so if you have a patient, you get a report back and you're like, hey, we, we need to do, go through your laser therapy. We've got a lot of doctors that use Lynette. Hey, let's do this. Great, let's do it. And then you just do a control, maybe, a, you know, three or four months later and see if that treatment was successful to see if that was, that was going to work with the patient. Um, but think of periodontal disease and treatment like a medical model. Um, you know, think of it like, you know, you go in, you break your, I mean, this, there's nothing to do with infection, but you go in, you break your ankle, they do surgery six weeks, you know, or so later they do an x-ray to find out, Hey, how's it healing? Not that the surgery was okay. Cause it's done, but how's it healing? Can you walk now? Can you do this? And so that's what periodontal disease, we have to think about that medical model um, that everyone heals differently. Everybody responds differently to infection um, and to treatment. So, um, and a lot yeah. of the studies too, um, when it comes to lasers and lasers are incredible. I mean, they're such a yeah. gift in dentistry and, and there's so many great technologies now that we can utilize. Um, and all of our states are very different in terms of what a hygienist can actually do for the patient. But we also have to remember like these bugs are not just in our mouth and all mm -hmm. of our patient, like Jennifer was saying, their host immune system is so different. And so it's really hard to know like how, how my immune system is going to fight off AA, you know, versus Jennifer's immune system. I mean, Jennifer like never gets sick in her life, literally. I mean, she's like never <laughs> even had the flu. So I'm going to guess if both of us had, had AA, she'd probably fare better than me. Um, so, but I would want to know that it's gone, that whatever treatment happened, like that, that nasty stuff is gone. It's gone. So right. the best way to do that is, is to wait some now, you know, do your therapy, give it some time because homeostasis is still going to take six to eight weeks. So no matter how amazing the therapy um, type is, you know, using antimicrobials, maybe antibiotics in certain situations, laser, GBT, all the different, you know, things that we can do now, um, they're all gonna, they're all, they're all great. And everything can work for individual patients, but we just, what we're hoping for is that this, 
the therapy is successful so that we're not having these rebounding periodontal mm -hmm. infection cases right. where the patient doesn't really ever get all the way better. better. Because what we understand now is that with the with an old fashioned mechanical model, you know, strictly mechanical, when we're just doing SRP without antimicrobials, without any kind of other things, a lot of these pathogens, they repopulate within six weeks. Spirochetes specifically can lie dormant. So what they do is like, we clean them out, we scale them out, you know, two weeks later, the patient looks beautiful. Everything's great. We've worked so hard. The patient's really on board. They go off on their own for three months. They don't really do anything extra. They go back to brushing once or twice a day, flossing whenever something's stuck in their teeth. And then they come back and it's like, oh my gosh, it's just bleeding all over. Well, those spirochetes, if they had them to start, which we could have seen on a microscope, um, those spirochetes basically were just lying dormant until the biofilm and the mouth got enough yuck going on in it until the, <clears throat> the environment became just suitable enough to where they're going to flourish again. And so that's where we would have caught those things right away. And so home care and I mean, there's so many parts of therapy there's that's so many not parts. just scaling. It's not just lasers. It's not just anything. It's, it's all these things together. I mean, there's, it's not just the test. It's not, you know, it's, it's all the things. It's all Right. Right. And that's the same with the medical, you know, with medicine and also think about, so uh, if you get diagnosed with strep throat, let's say uh, Lenix has strep throat. The first thing you're going to do is not eat or drink after her probably. And you're going to get rid of her toothbrush. You're going to be careful, you know? And so that's the same, same thing with periodontal disease. We have to remember this is an infection. And so clean out everything, you know, run your, get rid of your toothbrush. Um, you know, if you're eating and drinking after somebody, you definitely can uh, recontaminate yourself. So that's why sometimes it's really good to check uh, the spouse or, um, you know, whomever's in the household. And that way, if you're really having a hard time getting that uh, infection under control, uh, sometimes it may be, um, oh boy, sitting in there in the living room. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We've blamed Marlon for that seriously, before. Yeah, I've, but seen, seriously. I've seen Marlon's teeth before. <laughs> we have another question here, Jen. Yeah. Um, so any studies or results done on antibiotic resistant for systemic antibiotics given to periodontal clients? MDs here in Canada are reluctant to prescribe mm -hmm. antibiotics unless absolutely necessary. Interested to know about dentists. Do you find that this is more um, more prevalent, more prevalently done in a periodontal office compared to a GP? Mm -mm. No, we've got more customers that are, if we had to line up our customers, we definitely have more GPs. We do have peri perio offices, but that being said, yes, antibiotic resistancy is, I mean, especially in the U S is a big, big situation. Uh, but I wouldn't blame it on us as dental professionals. I mean, I can go down with a runny nose and get a Z pack tomorrow. So, and that is the fact is that, you know, as a broad, broad spectrum antibiotic. So with our test, the one good thing, um, the AAP, and I can't remember the date of the journal. Uh, I've got it on my computer here and I can find it. But if you are going to recommend antibiotics, they've got five lists of, hey, if you're going to recommend antibiotics, you have to do this, 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 and this. Four out of the five is bacterial testing. So if you are going to recommend antibiotics, you may, you have to do a bacterial test. Um, that way it's not a shot in the dark. You're actually targeting the exact pathogens um, and you're not just throwing a broad spectrum antibiotic um, to the patient, for example, like a Z-Pak. So um, did I answer that? Yeah, I think that's okay. good. I mean, okay. I think it was just, you know, um, essentially yeah. what, what we're kind of trying to preach sort of is yeah. don't do antibiotics unless... You They're absolutely necessary. have to. And if you're going to do antibiotics, do the right one. Do the right one. And make sure yeah, the like patient's you know what's there. Right. And make sure the patient's ready. If you have a patient that like doesn't care and they're not going to do their home care and they're not going to take their antibiotics correctly and they're not going to come back, then I probably wouldn't give them the antibiotics because it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, when we, you know, when we do recommend the antibiotics, or I like to say the word suggest the antibiotics, uh, you know. We have to think about, you know, the pharmacy is so busy, they're just going to say, here's your pills. So you really have to make sure they know, hey, take this at eight and eight or, you know, make sure and tell them that um, the exact times that they take the antibiotics um, because they just, you know, I, and a lot of patients, what they do is, is you give them the antibiotics and they don't take them for another week, which is that's not going to do any good. We really want to take those antibiotics 
after doing um, some sort of a debridement, a full mouth debridement. That way the antibiotics can penetrate. So that's also She's very not talking important. about like a full mouth debridement, like the code, like full mouth debridement. No, no. What Jennifer means is like more full mouth disruption. Disruption. You, like, so, you know, getting subgingibly like disrupting the biofilm, disrupting yeah. the gunk. Like, you know, you don't I need want to, I need to do an antibiotic that. before you would start therapy. You want to basically topically and systemically do it is, is the best way. So in conjunction with one of your periodontal therapy appointments mm -hmm. is the most ideal time. So if it was, if it was a situation where, um, if it was a situation where you did not start um, the animal, let's say it was three months later, you took an after test and it still doesn't look and you're like, wow, this person really does need a systemic antibiotic. Well, you would have made that decision at their three month periodontal maintenance appointment where you just disrupted it. Mm -hmm. So that counts as you disrupted everything you've already done, like your full mouth periodontal therapy. And so now you can go ahead and call in a systemic antibiotic right. if you deem it still is necessary. Right. It's absolutely. Okay. Jennifer, so just so you know what time it is, 37 after. Holy jumping. Okay. I'm cruising. Uh, can I take a bacterial test of my patient recently had scaling and root planing? And so we've got our scaling and root planing resistant microorganisms. And of course I've got them color coded. So we've got the uh, red complex and two of the orange complexes and the AA, of course. So uh, these are your scaling and root planing resistant microorganisms. Uh, so basically you can go in there and scale, scale, scale. Uh, and all you're going to do is just, you know, just move these little critters around. Uh, this is super old, but I love it. AA and PG. So those are your left pathogens uh, on the left-hand side of our report. Uh, cannot be removed uh, by mechanical therapy. And then also AA and PG can actually increase following scaling and root planing. So being, that being said, yes, you can do a bacterial test with doing scaling and root planing, but I would do a bacterial test uh, before you're, you'd use the ultrasonic because we do know that ultrasonic will just kind of flush out everything. And I think we, this kind of goes into your topic. How does it change your treatment? And that what is the best way to start implementing? I say Monday morning, but what's tomorrow, Thursday, but I mean, you can say Monday, right? Uh, how's the best way to start implementing this test on Monday morning? And I think you have that, Tasha, and your little yes. uh, program. Um, one last question, and then I'll pull yep. it on. So uh, would you prescribe antibiotics a day before a hygiene appointment to reduce the bacteria in the bloodstream? Uh, so technically, what they say is within six hours of the appointment. So if you have an appointment in the afternoon and you want to take uh, the antibiotics that morning, that is fine. But technically they say six hours. So uh, just make sure that patient comes in uh, for their hygiene visit. And then make sure you're able to do a, you know, to go full mouth with your ultrasonic because you want to break up that biofilm layer full mouth. So if you're, if the patient only says, eh, I just want to do half the mouth, then you want to wait to that next follow-up appointment before you recommend the antibiotics because you want to make sure and get to the entire mouth. That's most, that's very important like you talked about. Okay. I know you have this slide, Tasha. So I stopped okay. here. Yep. And I will share myself. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Let me get my stuff moved off to the side here. All right. So I'm going to go over exciting case studies. So what my goal is, is just to show you guys, um, I know a lot of you are already using testing, but there's a few that are not. And so this is kind of how you just implement it. So sometimes when we're implementing lab testing, it feels like one more thing. And as a hygienist, I can tell you some days it's like, my goodness sakes, I don't have time for one more thing. So I don't even know how I'm going to manage this. And so hopefully going through all these steps today will help you to not feel like the overwhelm of there's one more thing. So there we go, my clicker. So this is just a decision tree about what's healthy and what's not. So Jennifer kind of mentioned that in the very beginning of hers of, um, you know, deciding like what's healthy and what, and what's not. So what I created here was a decision tree for your profi patients. And so what you're seeing on the left-hand column is 
you're going to continue to do a prophy. And on the right hand column, that means that you need to move into something more like gingivitis therapy. So this, this is for a patient that has four millimeters or less pockets. And those four millimeter pockets are pseudo pockets. And so there's no bone loss, no radiographic bone loss on the x-ray. So to help to help determine, and I know there's other parameters, but this is just a good baseline. So determine if somebody is healthy or not, a, a plus sign is a yes and a minus sign is a no. So basically if somebody has less than two yeses, then we can work on home care, we can work um, on all those different regimens that we want that patient to do and then get them back in three months to determine whether or not they still need, that they do need gingivitis therapy or everything has resolved with their better home care. So in this scenario, we have a positive biofilm slide. Well, what the heck's a biofilm slide? If any of you guys follow my Instagram, you know that I'm absolutely in love with using a microscope chair side. And what the biofilm slide is, is we just take a curette and explore anything and just go slightly subgingival and we're taking subgingival biofilm. Some of us used to think that this is all plaque, plaque and biofilm are an interchangeable term. I learned that in hygiene school, but I've learned that they're very different. So think of plaque is the white fluffy gunk on top of the gums and the biofilm is that like creamy slimy gunk that's like the matrix material subgingival. And so what we wanna do is just take a little plaque sample, put it on the microscope, see what's going Going on. So we know if somebody has unhealthy biofilm, um, that they're far more likely to have a gum tissue infection than somebody that has a healthy biofilm. There are certain shapes that are just never part of your good bacteria. So it's like a picture for the patient. They can see exactly what's going on or a video, not really a picture. So if a patient didn't have any bleeding on probing, no bleeding on scaling, they did have adequate home care and the cleaning portion of their appointment did not take more than 20 minutes. So by cleaning, I mean your actual hands-on curette, cavitron, GBT, whatever process you do to clean their teeth should not take you no more than 20 minutes. If it does, that would be a yes. It's taken me longer and they would move over to the gingivitis column. Um, essentially, if somebody has too much gunk on their teeth, like because they just don't do a good job, then they still do, in my opinion, need more than just a prophy. So when it comes to health history, so health history to me is more of a risk factor than causative. So we know that somebody with gingivitis, for instance, our gingivitis diabetes is going to be a lot more likely to have gingivitis or periodontal disease, but that's not for sure. So it's not like I have, I have diabetes, therefore I have X, you know, I have periodontal disease. So we want to be aware of it because it can dictate our treatment in terms of how frequently do we want to see that patient? How much more high risk are they? But it's not a cause and effect kind of thing. So in this scenario, in the left-hand column, if they just had an unhealthy biofilm slide, then where I would start with that patient is hands-on home care. And so when it comes to home care, it is mission critical. We as the hygienists are not the star of the show. Like if, if the patient doesn't do what they need to do on a daily basis, they will never stay very healthy. And so what I do with all of my patients is mirror, show them how to brush their teeth, full mouth brushing, not just, not just the teeth, all the vestibule, the roof of their mouth, tongue scraper, swish, gargle, spit with an antimicrobial mouth rinse. Um, and then I give them the toothbrush and I have them show me. Um, I think it's really easy. And it was super easy for me to forget when I was practicing full time for so long, like I would just tell patients how to brush because I didn't, I only had so much time. Right. Um, but when I went back to really showing people, I was always surprised at how poor our patient's dexterity is because they're not a clinician like we are. They don't work in dentistry. Their, their, their hand dexterity is just not as good as ours. And so we really need to have them show us how they're doing it and then guide their hand to the right position so that they can feel what they need to do. And we need to repeat that more times than we want to. And so if they can get their home care under control, then they're more likely to get the rest of it under control. And so let's say they have two or more that's positive. So they have any amount of bleeding on probing. I don't care if it's two spots, um, any amount of bleeding on scaling, inadequate home care, the, the scaling cleaning part is taking more than 20 minutes. Those are all signs to me that that patient needs to move into gingivitis therapy. Because generally speaking, I mean, there's patients that don't have any bleeding on probing, but then you get in there and you're like, oh my God, there's bleeding on scaling everywhere. So that's kind of like a, my decision tree of what's healthy, what's not. So now with our periodontal patients, so these are going to be patients that they've already went through SRP um, at some point, um, either in your practice or in another practice. I don't, I mean, it doesn't matter when, but it's the same exact rules and the literally the same parameters, except for this patient does have bone loss. And so 
Um, I won't go through like this in as much detail since I just did it in the gingivitis, but it's literally the same thing. So if you have a patient that already went through SRP, let's say one year ago, 12 months, and they're very insurance dependent, and you determine that two or more of these are positive. So the, the periodontal maintenance is every three months is just not working then what that patient needs is still more than a periodontal maintenance appointment. So if they weren't on a very strict three month recall, I would start there and I would start with their home care. But you could also consider six week biofilm management appointments. Is insurance gonna cover that? No, but if the patient's not going to do it at home or is just unable to, maybe they have Parkinson's, um, then I would recommend every six weeks. So perio maintenance, six, six weeks later, you know, uh, biofilm management. So that's either full mouth Cavitron, full mouth GBT, just really to help them disrupt and control this infection. And if you had a lab test on top of that, you would have a very good guide of how aggressive is their biofilm. And that will guide you into maybe they just need a two month periodontal maintenance appointment. Um, and my recommendation is always recommend the patient, recommend to them what is what you know is going to help them and let them tell you yes or no. Um, some patients will say no. Some patients are just really insurance dependent and they're not able to go there, but that doesn't mean we can't recommend it. So I hope that kind of helps in terms of what's healthy, what's not. So now let's kind of put this into action. So this was a patient that came to a practice um, that I was working at. He was a new patient. He was 28 years old. So he reported that it was about two to three years um, since he had, had been to the dentist. He was a trim young man. And for all practical purposes, he was really clean cut. I mean, clearly his mouth was not clean cut, but the rest of him was. He did The only uh, chief concern was about his gums. And so um, he didn't have any teeth that hurt, but he did say that his gums were brushing when he... Or, brushing, bleeding when he brushed. Um, and so he really did think that there was something wrong lifestyle. Um, there was, I didn't know anything, um, about his lifestyle as far as risk factors go, you know, in terms of, you know, a lot of stress or, you know, a partner with gum disease or anything like that. And so this new patient process was an oral systemic medical dental history. We did a full set of x-rays, full mouth probing, the whole thing, um, intraoral photos and a biofilm slide. And so for him, um, this is what his slide looked like. And so as you guys can see, and even if, even if you don't use a microscope, you can tell that this just looks gross. So even if I didn't tell you what anything on there was, you would know that like that looks gross and you wouldn't want it in your mouth. And so for him, these are a bunch of spirochetes. He's got amoebas, lots of white blood cells. So um, spirochetes are the snakes. The amoebas are these little sluggy looking things. And all these just globular things here are a bunch of white blood cells. So huge inflammatory response, huge infection going on. And so for him, it was really easy for me to say, think of these bacteria like termites in the foundation of a house. They live deep down inside the gum tissue, not just on top of it, which is why a traditional cleaning isn't what's going to make things healthy. What you've gotten in the past was a traditional cleaning, like a car wash. What you really need is more like a full detail, really letting us spend time getting in those nooks and crannies, places we just can't reach with a traditional cleaning. So for him, he was on board. He knew he had a problem. It had been several years. So he was a pretty easy person to, to transition into, into full mouth SRP, full mouth periodontal therapy. So that first day of his new patient appointment, we started with, um, with the microbe um, test and he came back with eight of the 11. And as you guys can see, they were very high. Um, so we did full mouth periodontal therapy with him using antimicrobials. So this particular practice uses Cavitrons, antimicrobials, water picks. They don't, um, they don't have GBT. They didn't have lasers. Um, and so that I used what I had. And so with him, we really worked on home care. Brushing technique was huge. I believe every person in the universe needs a water pick, water flosser. I don't care what brand you use. I just believe that everyone needs one. Um, and he used an antimicrobial in that, got on a tongue scraper, water pick. Um, and then I give all my patients these Healthy Smiles home care sheets. They're available on my website. And it just takes them through exactly what they need to do every day. And I just give it to them at that appointment. And so um, after, so he went, had two periodontal therapy appointments with a six week um, periodontal follow-up. And then at three months, this is when we did his follow-up test. And we did do, um, the doctor did want to do a systemic antibiotic with him just because he had PG um, on his test as well. And, and all the red, the red complex there. So he was just so lit up. And so, um, he was really good with his home care. And as you can see, I mean, his gum tissue color is, I don't know how many shades lighter, so much better. Um, his teeth are 
clearly a lot cleaner. Um, and his lab test shows me that his, that his therapy is working. So did we get rid of all the bacteria? No. Are you always going to get rid of all the bacteria? Probably not, but it's not bad to have some bad bacteria. It's bad to have bad bacteria and the host is not fighting it off. So I could see for us from his after photo, even just showing him, he was like, whoa, I can't even, you know, believe how good it is. Um, and from there, he, you know, and it really helped for him too to like look at his lab test before and after, to look at his gum tissue before and after. And then in addition to that, to look at his, um, to look at his slides before and after. So it's very helpful when patients have objective data that they understand. So obviously my probe depths were less. He didn't have the bleeding on scaling like he had before. Um, overall, all the diagnostic parameters were much less, but looking even at his before and after slide and his before and after tests and the photos, like he knew what he did at home. He knew what we did there. He understood then that his role in home care was just as important as mine in order for him to stay healthy. So that's kind of putting it all together. Um, here's a very different case than that. So um, same practice. This was a routine young lady. She had been to the practice many times, 35 years old, never had a problem, but she uh, was new to me and new to the microscope and new to lab testing. And so she didn't have any concerns. She had been there six months ago, clear medical history. Um, again, lifestyle factors, nothing that, that was, that was um, apparent to me. She wasn't due for any x-rays. And so I always look at the previous x-rays to see if there's bone loss um, on there. Cause I always want to make sure that my chart prep and I know what I'm getting myself into before I see that patient. And so she had bleeding on probing on like a couple of teeth um, overall, good, good oral hygiene, a little bit of, um, interproximal biofilm and subgingival. So she had an unhealthy biofilm slide. Now that again, going back to my decision tree of gingivitis, she was, you know, four millimeters, um, and less, she did have some clinical attachment loss. So that was above four in a couple spots, but her pocket depths, um, and most of that was because of recession. So her pocket depths were really four millimeter and below without, you know, any bone loss. And so for her, she would still have gone into the gingivitis classification. Now, if you don't have a microscope and you're like, well, how, what, what's my other positive? She would have, she would have had um, a lot of bleeding on scaling, which I'm going to show you in a second. But first, let me show you her biofilm slide. So if you look really closely, um, you can see a bunch of really skinny, tiny little spirochetes. And a lot of times when somebody doesn't have very mature biofilm, their spirochetes tend to be smaller, but she has tons of white blood cells. So what that tells me is that her body is really fighting off some, I mean, for whatever reason, she's having a huge inflammatory response. So for some of our patients, depending on your host's immune system, like, like earlier when I was comparing Jennifer and I to both having AA and I figured I would do worse than her because her immune system just kicks butt. So, so for her, a little bit of a few spirochetes and great home care still equaled infection. She still was having all that inflammation because if you're going to have a lot of white blood cells, you're going to be so much more likely to have bone loss because it's our body that destroys itself essentially with, you know, the osteoblast, osteoclast, that whole scenario that goes on there. So for her, if we would have started scaling and thought everything was fine, and this happened to me more times than I'd like to admit in my hygiene career before I had a microscope and before I did lab testing, but I would tell somebody that they looked great. I did my full mouth probe. And then I got in there and I was like, oh my God, there's a river of blood. Where is this blood coming from? I already told them they look good. I'm 35 minutes into my appointment. I can't stop now. So, I mean, I could, but I just didn't really know what to do. I, I didn't have the skills. And so at that point, what I used to do is just work on home care. And I'd say, you know, you did have some bleeding. I'm not, you know, I'm very concerned about that. Let's check it again. What I now know to do is stop, grab the mirror, show the patient. I, and what I would do then is say, everything feeling okay? Hold your mouth open for a second. Don't swallow. And then I would give them the mirror and let them see all the bleeding. And I'd say, you know, I'm really surprised. It's not looking quite as good as I thought. And you're actually having a lot of bleeding. And I make all my patients know that bleeding is so weird. So when I talk to them about bleeding, I say, I don't say you're just having some bleeding. I'm like, you're actually having bleeding. Like, like I've never seen it before. Right. And like, does that <laughs> infection hurt? <laughs> But I want them to see that blood because they don't know what we're, what we're in there. Like usually what we do is we rinse with a bunch of water and then we have them close over the suction and they don't know that there's a bunch of blood mixed into that as well. So we have to really show and educate our patients on what we see. 
And so in this scenario, I already knew that her biofilm slide had all those white blood cells on it. So I expected to see this amount of bleeding. Um, but what you could do is just grab a scaler right after, you know, the, the probing, if you got a couple spots of probing and you weren't really sure and just scale a couple teeth. I mean, the patients don't really know what order we traditionally go in. So if you're a little bit on the fence, just, you know, tell the patient, I'm just going to clean around these teeth really quick here. And really what you're doing is investigating further you know, if you didn't have a microscope to tell you. So um, we, I recommended gingivitis therapy for her. And so when she saw her slide and she saw the little snake, she was like, oh, gross, like get those out of there. So she was ready to go forward with gingivitis therapy. So we did a lab test and she did have seven of the 11 pathogens, but as you can see, her red complex is really under control. She did have some TF, but it wasn't, you know, anything you know, skyrocketing there. So we did full mouth gingivitis therapy, which consisted of two appointments. And then, um, home care. I don't care how, what your pocket depths are. I, like I said before, I show everyone how to brush their teeth. They then show me how they brush their teeth. I get them on a water pick and I don't really care if they floss. I mean, I tell them if they have food stuck floss, but other than that, use a water pick every single day, um, tongue scraper and, um, mouth rinse. And so she went through that whole protocol and then, um, three months later, and then we did not do a systemic antibiotic for her. I mean, she was in her mid thirties. She didn't have any other risk factors. And so for her, we wanted to make sure that all those pathogens were lower because the test did kick out two systemic antibiotics, amoxicillin and metronidazole that you can see right here. And amoxicillin because of the green complex and the metronidazole was because of this orange complex. But for her, you know, she's not that group that Jennifer talked about that, you know, that these tests were run against, you know, class three perio advanced cases are, are why a lot of times sometimes we'll see some of those antibiotics, but because she's young, healthy, her immune system's more robust. We weren't, we didn't have to do that. And so with her after tests, we did, I think it was about four months later. Um, you can see like all of her pathogens were much lower. And so again, it's okay to still have some bugs on your after test. We're not looking for sterile mouths. We're looking for homeostasis. Um, all of us could have bad bugs in our mouth at all moments, but if our immune system's taking care of them, meaning like they're just all living in harmony together, that's okay. There's, that means there's not bleeding on probing. There's not bleeding on scaling. The biofilm looks good. And, and that means that we can just, you know, continue our merry way. But that patient also needs to know you need to be coming in here on a regular. So with her after slides, um, again, her before and then her after and her after literally looks like like it's a picture, but it is a live video. Um, bunch of little cocci in there, which is totally normal. Plaque is this stuff right here, which is completely normal. It's not diagnostic at all, um, but way better. I mean, so you don't even have to have a trained eye to know that that looks a lot better. So this is my last, um, I know we're getting right to the top of the hour guys, and we were trying to do an hour, but we're going to go over. This is my last case though, and then we'll open it up for more questions. I know there's a few questions in the chat and I'll get to them right after this. Um, so this was a 59 year old female. So she was coming in for a routine cleaning. So again, um, not new to the practice, new to me, new to the microscope, new, new to lab testing. So her chief concern was that her gums were receding. Um, it had been six months since her last cleaning. She was a type one diabetic for at least 30 years. She reported that it was somewhat controlled, um, questionable there. And we chatted a lot and her lifestyle was very stressful and she had inadequate sleep. And so we know now that sleep is so critically important to our entire body's ability to rest and recover and to heal ourselves from, from, from memory to just anything. I mean, if we're not getting enough sleep, we're releasing way too much cortisol, which is, as we all know, is a stress hormone. It's good to have stress hormone, but not constantly. So she really had a lot of um, risk factors in terms of how healthy she was. She was due for a full set of x-rays. So she had three to four millimeter pockets, but as you can see, her clinical attachment loss was way more. I mean, six plus, um, she was a Bruxer and she was not compliant with her night guard. And so for her, as you can see, her home care is amazing. So most of us would think like, what's a little bit more scaling going to do if we do scaling and root planning, like there's nothing to scale off this woman's teeth. Um, but that's not what that's. And a lot of that is because we've always, and in school, we were taught like, we need to learn how to scale. And in order to pass our hygiene clinical boards, we had to be able to scale the gunk off people's teeth in order to pass. But a lot of that is really 
an older understanding of what was really going on. Like Jennifer was saying, like, this is medicine. And so we have to understand that this is more of a bacterial infection than a, than a calculus and plaque and all the gunk on people's teeth. Yes, people need to do a great job cleaning their teeth, but if they have all these bugs, like tons of white blood cells, lots of spirochetes, rods, I mean, and all this stuff swimming in their gums, then it doesn't really matter that they don't have any calculus on their teeth because her black triangles are going to get so much worse because she's a Bruxer and she has gum disease and she has diabetes, making her three times more likely to lose bone over it. So for her, um, oh, my slide, hang on, wait, there we go. Sorry. So for her, um, it's, you know, it's not all about the bleeding. She did still have some bleeding. As you can see, she has bone loss everywhere. So for her, we did recommend full mouth. I mean, SRP, if you're, you know, thinking about codes, but for her, it was really about full mouth antimicrobials and really getting everything a lot healthier. And so we did a lab test on her eight of the 11 pathogens, including PG. So PG is one of those really nasty actors, even though it's not above threshold, you just, you just don't want PG. And so for her, we did, you know, full mouth gum tissue therapy. Now I hardly had to scale at all, but I just flushed the daylights out of her. Um, this was the same practice as those other ones, which doesn't have GBT, doesn't have, um, a laser. And so we used antimicrobials. Home care was huge. Just getting her on a water pick with antimicrobials as well, getting her to use that night guard, you know, helping her to understand that if you want to her main concern was the recession. And I really wanted her to be able to do gum grafting in the future, but I would never ever refer a patient to get gum grafting when I saw a lab test that looks like this, because that is a recipe for more recession. So the body can't heal when there's active infection. And so if you can't heal with active infection, then we got to first get rid of the active, you know, the active infection. And so, um, Dr. Mark Hyman, a functional medicine doctor talks about weed seed feed. So get rid of the bad bugs so that the body can then heal. And then, you know, seed and feed it's like, okay, does this patient then need probiotics because we've had to give them an antibiotic? Does this patient need more home care? You know, what are all the different tools that this patient needs in order to rebuild the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome and to get their whole body healthy. And so for her, um, her, her therapy looked very similar to the others. Um, but she did, we did recommend a systemic antibiotic for her and she was on the shortest leash ever. Now her cleaning appointments were pretty easy because she didn't have a lot of gunk on her teeth, but for her, it was all about stress management, getting enough sleep, really helping for her to understand that she needed to take control of her life or the recession was going to continue because everything was out of whack. And so there's so many things that we could do with our very small amount of time, but, a, but large amount of time with our patients, we get so much more than physicians do. So after her therapy, um, her test looks so much better. I mean, did we get rid of all the bugs? No, but did we knock down the, the really bad ones? Absolutely. And look at her gum tissue color. I mean, if you look really closely, you know, seven through 10 here, there's like this red rim right up in here and it's completely gone. And down even at the lower, you know, at the lower gingiva here, it's just pale pink. So, you know, looking at this mouth initially, we may not have thought that it looked very red. Um, but when you have the comparison side by side, it's very obvious. And so um, with her before and after slide, eh, um, you know, it looked a lot better. She did still have, you know, a few spinning rods in there and, and she still had some red blood cells and she still had a few spirochetes. But overall, it was way, way, way better. So she was certainly many steps, you know, in the right direction. Can I can I pause you real quick? Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the antibiotic threshold line on that one. Uh, mm -hmm. So can I go back to that if you would? I don't think I can. Um, the PG you said. This one. Uh, yep, yep, yep. So I forgot to mention this, but we also have the ability to remove this line. I don't even know if you knew this, Tasha. Oh but yeah, so, I did, but I forgot. Okay. Yeah. So we've got a, some customers, um, and I, I know when exactly who I'm thinking about, he doesn't want this line. And so that's what actually made us think, okay, we don't, we don't necessarily have to have this line because he believes if, if it's below the line, 
um, he still wants to treat it. So he wants to be more aggressive uh, with his patient. So he does not want the line, but we still recommend the antibiotic, uh, but it, they just don't have that line because he doesn't, for example, he doesn't want any AA. He doesn't want any PG with the patient. Um, and so that's an option as well. So if there's ever a time when you have a patient and we can do this per patient, uh, if you have a patient that you're just, you want that line gone, <laughs> we can do that. That's no good to know, Jen. Yeah. And remember, we cannot treat what we don't diagnose. So, yeah, I mean, we have to know what's healthy, what's not healthy, we and we have to know what's there. Yeah. And, you know, just like you using your, your microscope, I mean, you've got to have diagnostics. Yeah. And, and ones that patients can understand. I mean, the great thing with a lab test too, is, I mean, all of us have had a physical at one point in our lives and had blood work done for something. And so, I mean, now when I get my blood work done, it's like, you know, I just log into the portal. I get an email that says that your blood works in, I log into the portal and there's like, you know, normal, low, high. And all I look at is what's high. I don't care what's regular what's oh, in the normal yeah. <laughs> or I can mean, I'd look at low if something was low but right. if it's not flagged like I just okay and that's kind of mm -hmm. like this test too like what bacteria do I have how, are they red I mean how bad are they how easy is it going to get for me to get rid of this I mean do I just have some orange and, and some yellow then good let's go ahead and do some gingivitis let's let's reverse this thing um but if I had some red then I might be a little bit more concerned like ooh, this we, we better keep me on a short leash so who to test? Um, they're super common question, don't you think, Jen? Oh, yeah. Every so day. what do we all use this test for? So not every office wants to use it for gingivitis. I personally, I don't know how many people I've tested, too many thousands, thousands and thousands of tests. Um, I've just found that some people with gingivitis have so much bacteria. And a lot of times it was like I was saying earlier, it's, it's a family of origin kind of thing or who they're living with and who they're around. And I mean, how many antibiotics do you do with gingivitis? Not many, but that after test tells me like, did I get rid of it all? Um, and then diagnosis of periodontal disease. And then of course, what I just mentioned the three month follow-up chronic periodontitis. Um, a lot of, a lot of patients will seek out practices that have testing when they've heard of it, because if they've been seeing the same doctor for years and years and years, and it's not getting better, they're looking for a solution. Is, is somebody else doing something different that can help me? And so that's a really great one for the periodontitis. And then prior to a sinus lift or, or a dental implant is so critical. I mean, so many implants are being done now and I mean, I was talking to a friend the other day and she shared that her dentist had done several implants on patients that had only been there for an emergency exam. And I was like, girl, and she, and she knows better. Like, and she said, I know I need to talk to him about it. Um, it's just, you get the, I mean, it, there, there's, there's just so much that so many people don't know that we don't, we just think like, it's like putting a screw in a two by four, but my goodness, there's going to be a lot of implant failures if we don't make sure that that foundation is really healthy, I mean, it's just not being looked at enough. Uh, and like Jennifer mentioned earlier, medical clearance for surgery, this is super common now. I mean, so many dental offices are getting clearance forms from orthopedic surgeons, heart surgeons, all kinds of things. And then really large restorative cases. I mean, if somebody is gonna be investing 20, 30, 40, $80,000 in a bunch of veneers or crowns, I mean, don't you want that dentistry to last like a lifetime? if it can. And so, um, and, and, and not look bad in five years because there's recession or because the gum tissue all of a sudden gets all swollen and bleedy. And you're like, oh my gosh, what's happening with this patient? Everything was great. And now all of a sudden I did these veneers and now their gum tissues reacting and, and all kinds of things like that. So it's really just, um, super helpful. So that's, that's my spiel of it. Let me um, stop my share here real quick.